Hello, and welcome to the Ask the Industry podcast, episode 112. I'm comedian Simon Kane, and for those of you new to the show, this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand-up, comedy, radio, and today, talent management. Barry Katz is a talent manager who began working out of Boston. After failing to become a comedian himself, he started running clubs and representing comedians who are now household names, including Dave Chappelle, Bill Burr, Dane Cook, Whitney Cummings, Louis C.K., so many. We got into how he scouts for talent, what makes star quality in the U.S. versus the U.K., what the future of the industry looks like for acts starting out now with the advent of Netflix and social media, and whether people even need agents anymore with the way that the internet is breaking down the boundaries between artist and fan. I found this really fascinating. I really liked hearing from someone from the other side of the world to me who works in management because I've interviewed a few agents in this country and obviously they're going to have a different perspective in what we have, which is a much smaller circuit, geographically at least, than the circuit they have over in America and Canada. So I think people get a lot out of this and I think it'll offer a unique perspective into what goes into creating a career for someone in comedy in America. Before I hit play on the interview, if you're new here, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. If you're old here, please do remember to give us an honest, ideally positive review in iTunes. And either way, please do join the Facebook group. It's called RC Industry Podcast and it's on Facebook, obviously. Before I hit play on the podcast, I just want to say that I have signed up for the Edinburgh Festival and I am currently previewing a show around the country. I won't go on about where and when that's going to be right now but if you want to take a look in the show notes and have a look and see where I'm going to be previewing and where I'm going to be at the Edinburgh Festival uh, that would be great I really appreciate seeing some of your faces at the shows it's always lovely to have the audience come down and say hey it's me I'm the person who tweets you or hi I'm a regular listener and I love it so if you could come down to a show that'd be really appreciated and or the Edinburgh Festival and if you're not able to come down if you could just pass on the message to a friend who's in the area that would be massively massively appreciated and i can't thank you enough for the support but for now without any more delays this is barry katz uh so i don't say hello to you or anything like that i just go right into it you, you can if you want it was, <laughs> hello <laughs> i well normally because what i'll do is i'll do the intro and post and then start the question straight should we just should we say hello? Okay, no pro- no problem. That no that that's fine. We can do that too. So before I before I started in talent management, it's kind of a, a strange story, and I, I hope I don't bore you or your audience, but I really had no idea what to do. I was in high school and I was sort of a odd alternative kind of kid. I was big and sort of uncoordinated. I was getting into trouble. Every day I had detention every day and um, it was bad and they sent me down to the guidance counselor and he was really cool, I'll never forget, his name was Mr. Costanza. He had me take this test, this weird test, and I'm sure all of you have taken it at one point in your time where you, you know, it's all these uh, bubbles that you're supposed to uh, put, fill in with a pencil the spot that you feel is right the answer is right for you and so you do all these questions and you're answering them you don't have any idea what the reason is for all these questions and then he takes some kind of a a weird sheet of paper and puts it over your sheet of paper and looks at how the answers line up and he says oh well you're supposed to be working with the disabled and you're meant to work with the disabled and that's what you're supposed to be doing but it's weird here it says that you're you like entertainment and you like to laugh and you like comedy, but it says here mostly that you like to figure out how to work with disabled kids and adults. And I said, I do? And he said, yeah, you do. So I'm going to give you some research of some camps around New England, where I was from. I was from Longmeadow, Massachusetts, which is an Indian word. It means Jews live here. And so I... I He gave me all the information. There was this one camp in Bedford, New Hampshire. Now, for your audience who doesn't know, there's two or three famous people in comedy from Bedford, New Hampshire. There's Sarah Silverman, Adam Sandler, and I believe, possibly, Seth Meyers. And so I uh, did my interview when I was 15 to be a counselor in training at this camp for disabled kids. I get the job. 
it's $200 for the summer plus room and board. And when I'm up there, I make a lot of mistakes, but I find myself writing different plays and different nighttime activities and and things for the kids and I do comedy sketches and get people involved and it's fun. It's an amazing experience. I end up being there for six years, but what I learned from that is when I went home that next summer, I my dad had passed away when I was four and I never really explored in the basement of all this stuff down there. And one day I pried open an old file cabinet and it had all these musty albums in it. And all the albums were African-American artists like Dinah Washington, Nat King Cole, Louis Armstrong, you name it. And there were only three white artists in all the albums. And they were comedy records. It was Jonathan Winter's Comedy and Tragedy, The Smothers Brothers, Crabs Walk Sideways, and Lobsters Walk Straight. And my favorite, The Button Down Mind of Bob Newhart. And for those of you who don't know, in 1959, Warner Brothers Records came to Bob Newhart and said, we want you to do a comedy album doing stand-up. And in his traditional stutter-step voice, he said, um, I, 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 I've never, um, I, I do radio and television sketches. I've never d d done a stand-up comedy before. And they said, don't worry about it. Just find the club, record it. We're going to do your album. And that album in 1959 was Warner Brother Records' first gold record. And so I love this record. I start playing the comedy records on a turntable that I had to get with what's called S&H green stamps. And for your older audiences around the world, when you were poor and went to the grocery store, they put a green stamp in the bag for each dollar. And you would tape them and lick them and put them in these books, and they were worth a certain amount of money. You'd go to a redemption center, and that's how I got my fold-down record player and played them. I memorized one of the routines called the driving instructor, and then when the next talent show happened at high school in between my first year of uh, camp for disabled kids and my second, I performed it in front of a thousand people. And surprisingly, it fucking killed. And I'm like, how is this possible? I'm, I'm, I'm getting a bigger response than Bob Newhart. And I was hooked with the bug and I loved it. But I didn't do it really again until I went to Boston University. And the last part of the story is there was a blizzard in 1978. Yes, I'm old. And in Boston, if you've ever been, there is a famous area called Kenmore Square, which, which three streets come off of. There's Commonwealth Avenue where Boston College and Boston University are where I went to school. There's Beacon Street, where the women's colleges were, like Simmons and Emanuel. And then there's Brookline Avenue, where Fenway Park is, where the Red Sox play. And so there was a federal emergency. There's no, there's no one on the streets. It's midnight. There's nothing. And I hear laughter. And unbelievably, I look over, and this place is still there. It's a brownstone pub called Crossroads. And so I open the door to my fate, and there's a stairway going straight up. Like, you know, when you go into somebody's house and you, you open the door and the stairway goes straight up with a banister? That's how this was. And so you're walking up the stairs, you're hearing the laughter and the murmuring of jokes, but you can't see anything because you're looking directly at the stairway. And I finally got up to the banister, and like a little kid, I'm holding on to both banisters I'm peeking through behind people's ankles and legs and looking through to the stage and I see a guy strumming a guitar who looks a little bit like a young Larry from the Three Stooges. And he's singing this song and comment on it, commenting on it. It's like yesterday, I remember this. Rachel, my dear, wish you were here. Oh, how I loved her. Having sex with Rachel was amazing. It was like a concert. Frisbees would be flying around the room. Beach balls would hit you in the head. And every time Rachel wanted more, she'd light a match. And the crowd laughed and applauded, and then he just looked out inquisitively and confused and said, 
Hang on one second. My dog is barking. One second. Hold that thought. Don't leave me. Never gets easy, does it? Anyway, so I want to finish the story. So then he, the claws, and then he just looks out confused and he says, thanks. And he walks off the stage through the crowd past me on the stairway and I'm looking back and forth like I'm, I'm like what just happened and I run down the stairs to find him I go outside gone and I run back upstairs and I ask the bartender I said who 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 was that and they said oh that's that's Stephen Wright so Stephen Wright was the first stand-up comedian I ever saw in my life and he inspired me and I signed up for the open mic night there and it was after a swimming championship. I shaved my head. I get there. There's this intimidating host there named Ross Bickford. They called him the taxi driver. And he brings me up and he says something like this. And I'm sure every comic listening has gone through something like this. He says something to the effect of, hey, this next guy is a really funny gay guy. I'm just kidding. He's not funny, and I hear he's hung like a buffalo. Please welcome Barry Katz. And, like, he eviscerated me, and I didn't know what to do. I just went on stage and said something to the effect of, you know, well, I had a really great time with you last night. And then I just went into this thing where I said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Bob Newhart, my favorite artist, and this album growing up was so meaningful to me, and I'd like to present to you something that you might never have heard it's a routine called The Driving Instructor by Bob Newhart. I do the bit, fucking kills again. And like Stephen Wright, I thought this is the way I'm supposed to do it. I just walk off stage and down the stairs and out the door. And I hear somebody chasing me. And I turn around, it's Ross Bickford, that intimidating guy who hosted and eviscerated me. And he says, Catsy, where did you come from, man? It's just incredible i want you to come back next week that was so great i said oh thank you so much we've never had anybody come in and do anything like that it was so wonderful please come back i said okay thank you and he looked at me and he said can i give you some advice and i said yeah what is it he said uh listen when you're when you're doing somebody else's bit like that don't fucking mention their name just take the bit and i looked at him like the dog looks at the answering machine and i knew what i had to do and i went back to the dorm that night and i pulled an all nighter writing my own stuff and then i started performing in the comedy clubs in boston doing really well until i uh, got a job as a doorman at this club called play it again sam's for ten dollars a night and i performed and then they fired that guy and gave me the club when i was a teenager and the rest is history and so that's, that's your first step into comedy, performing? Yes, sir. And how, how long were you performing before you... Do you still perform now? I, d I couldn't see anything online about that. No, if you did see that online, uh, you'd know that I probably would have uh, taken my own life long ago. That's, that, that, that's, how, bad, that's how bad I was. So how, how long were you a comedian for before you moved into the industry side of it? Well, you could ask Bill Burr and he'd say I was never a comedian. So, uh, and uh, many people would say I was never a comedian, but I probably did it for about uh, 10 years off and on. I hosted a lot of shows. I was a really, really great host. And um, I really was always able to, to do really, really well. I, when I hosted, I used to do this thing, and it's weird because I don't really... I'm not really good with a have a good memory, but when I hosted, I would do this thing where let's say there were eight people on a show, I would do my opening and I would talk to the crowd. I was a great spritzer talking to the crowd, and, you know, and I'd just be talking to the okay, you know, you sir with the 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 purple shirt and whatever joke I had there. You from Revere, Massachusetts. You the lady who blows people with gum in her mouth. Hey, the people that hate me. And then after every comic got off and the applause was like, let's hear it for Don Gavin, everybody. Oh, the guy in the purple shirt, the girl who chews gum and blows people, uh, the guy who's from accounting, 
the people who hate me, and I'd just add people along the way, and by the end of the show, there were like 27 callbacks. It's like I had, I had so many callbacks in my act, I had callback waiting. And so I was just like complete, co continuously doing that, and I was, so I was good at that. And, um, but I realized when I got to New York, um, which is another story, that I had to focus on being a manager and do that and not perform. Okay. And so w w let's put a date on this. Roughly when did you move to New York? Okay, so so I'm doing my thing in Boston, and things are going well. I've got the Play It Against Sam's. I've got another comedy club I'm booking, Stitches, uh, in Boston. I've got about 50 one-nighters and comedy clubs all over New England. i got a big operation there. Um, and I got married, and my wife passed away after eight months of being married at 23. And what happens, as your audience knows, there's this thing, it's a weird thing that happens. It's, I like to call it the negative positive thing. So what happens is, is that people come up to you and they hug you and they tell you how much they love you and how much you mean to them and if there's anything they can do which is an amazingly positive, wonderful thing for them to do. But then the other side of the coin is they also remind you of what happened to you. And so just when you get through with that and you go to the next part of the room, there's another person that comes up to you. And you know how comedy scenes are. There's like so many comics and it's like a fraternity. And so one day after a night where probably... 25 different people came up to me in four different locations. I decided I was going to make a change in my life. And the next morning I got in my car, and which was a 67 Camaro, my first car ever, that I bought for $200. And I drove to New York City, got off at the 79th Street Boat Basin exit, made the turn, drove as far as I could until there was a restaurant bar. I parked my car, put money in the meter, walked to the bar, and back then there were pay phones by the bar with the yellow, with the big thing hanging off them with the yellow pages. And I looked in the yellow pages and I found real estate agents. I called three. The first one that called me back on the pay phone, I said, listen, I'm, I'm looking for a studio apartment here on the Upper West Side. Huh where I was, where I landed, and um, they said, no problem, we'll meet you there, and we'll show you uh, a few places. The first place they showed me was on 82nd Street by Central Park, near where Seinfeld has his huge place, and the Museum of Natural History, and I took it. It was $940 a month. I put down first, last, and security, and I was living in New York. I had no furniture in my apartment, yet but I was there I didn't know what I was going to do but I knew I had to start fresh and my mother always said it as Frank Sinatra would also say if you can make it there you can make it anywhere and so yeah you can ask away and I was going to say so does that mean you stopped running those clubs when you moved no I, I left somebody in charge in my office um, her name was Nina Brower she's fantastic I loved her still love her and uh, she took over everything and ran everything for me and so you're now so you're now sort of in New York with no job but you have someone outsourced doing the clubs for you that's right I have I have no job no idea what the fuck I'm supposed to be doing or how I'm going to do it but I had a germ of a thought process in my head because at play it again Sam's when I took it over I decided to give people a shot that weren't working in Boston that much. So Bob Goldthwaite hosted my Wednesday show, Dennis Leary my Thursday show, Dana Gould my Friday show. Saturday I gave Lenny Clark, who from the show Rescue Me, I gave him $1,000 every Saturday night because he was the biggest fish in town. I said, the only way I'm going to get respect is if I overpay. 
and I overpaid him. Everybody was making like $25 to $45 a set. I paid him $1,000 on Saturday night, and he took it. And then Sundays was Anthony Clark from Yes Dear, and, and I had Stephen Wright and Paula Poundstone and Jonathan Katz, who created Dr. Katz there. So I, I formed those relationships. So when I went to New York, I, I, I knew from Dennis Leary, his manager, used to come down, Jason Solomon, I thought, you know, that's an interesting career. So when I went to New York, I called him and asked him about management, what it was like, and I, he gave me a lot of words of wisdom and encouragement. And then a friend of mine, Eddie Brill from Boston, had been running this comedy club in Greenwich Village, and he was leaving to go to L.A. And so I met with the owners, and unbelievably, I told them about my concept of doing the Boston Comedy Club in New York City. And they said, okay, we'll take the bar, you take the door, go for it, do whatever you want. And I renovated the whole place, and... and uh, and then I started realizing I wanted to do the same thing in New York that I did in Boston, which was rally around the young people who I thought were brilliantly talented. But this time I wanted to manage them. And so I started working with people like Louis C.K., Dave Chappelle, Tracy Morgan, Dane Cook, uh, Jeffrey Ross, you know, Wanda Sykes. I mean, there's so many I can't even begin to tell you uh, that Bill Burr, and it was just, it was a great, it was a great time. And and at this at this time, because those names, a lot of them, are giants of comedy now. And at the time, obviously, yeah, they weren't. Back, yeah, back then they weren't giants of comedy. They were like they hadn't even done. A lot of them hadn't even done a television show. Although Jay Moore, who I represented very early on and for 25 years. He was a booking machine, so he would book sitcoms, and he got Saturday Night Live. He was the first client I had that got Saturday Night Live. And then Tracy Morgan and Jim Brewer and Daryl Hammond followed. And then Dane Cook, who I represented, hosted the show twice, once a, a premiere um, episode. How did you gain their trust then? Because you they obviously know you as a person who promotes gigs, but to have them entrust you with their their whole calendar or, or their whole TV work. How, how did you do that? Well, I mean, I think the thing is, is that no one wanted to represent these people because they weren't making any money. But I made money from the comedy clubs and the bookings, so I wasn't, I didn't care about the money. I got an office in New York City at 57th and Broadway. It was like the size of like, like, you see the room you're in right now? It was probably one-fifth the size of your room you're in right now. But room for just a small desk, a chair next to it, and a chair in front of the desk. And I had a window overlooking 57 the Broadway, and it was $600 a month. And I said to the guy, this is outrageous. I mean, how can you charge me this? He said, do you want to be in New York City? Do you want to be in the fucking business? And I said, yes, I do. Then pay the fiddler. The thing is, you know, I was a young person, and I was at their level. So all they saw was a guy who was passionate about what they did, loved what they did, and let them know that I would make things happen. And if I didn't make things happen, you know, just get rid of me. You know, but I had a pension for always being persistent, and I would get these people things that, you know, and... and Pretty soon it was like, it was ridiculous. Things were happening that you just can't, I don't know. It's just not that it's unbelievable because I always believed in myself, but it became very apparent that I had the ability and the eye for talent. I, I don't know where it comes from. I, if you asked me how I know that, you know, somebody's going to make it, I can't tell you that. I have no fucking idea. It's just something that's innately always been inside me. And if you ask me if I have the ability to get them where they want to go, I almost always feel that way. Uh, yes, there's people that I haven't been as successful with, and, and I, it's well documented. You know, when I did my podcast on Industry Standard, my podcast with Bill Burr, 
you know, I resigned from working with Bill Burr after like, I think, I don't know, eight years. And I just felt like I wasn't, I don't know what was happening, but, you know, he wasn't booking the jobs and things weren't progressing and I wasn't helping him progress for some reason. And maybe it's just because we didn't mix together the right way. I have no idea. I love Bill Burr. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Bill Burr. Um, but I, re I resigned from working with Mike Epps, you know, as well, you know, when I didn't feel like I was having the right effect. And he's doing great. So, uh, and I've also been fired a million times, uh, too, and I've been hired a million times. So it's, um, but I, the thing about anything I guess I look at, and maybe the other comics looked at, was, you know, in any job, as your audience listens to this, whatever job you're in, the evidence that you have that lets you know that you're on the right track is an accumulation of successes. So you're not going to get a great reputation in your job if you only have one success. Yes, let's face it, there are exceptions. Um, let's say Mike Darnell, the executive uh president of alternative programming and reality at Fox. So he did a lot of reality shows that were successful. I'd say if you follow baseball, maybe there were some singles, some doubles. But then American Idol got on the air. And American Idol was like, that was like four grand slams in one game by one player. So, so for him... He didn't really, I'm not saying he didn't need to do anything else, but that show made the network like a billion dollars. So he could, he could survive really well with that one huge success. But for the most part in any job, you know, if you're in a law firm, you know, you're not going to get, move up in the company if you only win one big case. You have to win a lot of cases. You know, at the 7-Eleven, at the you're not going to move up as manager unless your 7-Eleven does better than all the other 7-Elevens in the area. You know, every year for like five years in a row. Uh, if you're, you know, a network, you're not going to become number one if you don't have more than one hit. And so for as a manager or in anything, producing you have to show people that you're capable and what you do with those people is successful, not just once, not just twice, not just three times. But in my case, I, I could argue that, I mean, and it's hard for me because I, I feel like I, I always want to err on the side of humility. But I mean, the evidence shows that I mean, I think there's got to be over 10 different artists that I worked with who nobody knew. No one even knew their names. They had never did anything. And they became huge, huge, huge household names with their talent and my talent. And I, you know, I'm not saying it wouldn't have happened without me. Who knows? Uh, but... It's not a coincidence. Once is a coincidence, twice is a fluke, three times is luck. But if you're in a situation in any job where you're doing something, you know, so many times in a row, you get four people on Saturday Night Live before you know what you're doing with four different individuals, and you're not even, you don't even have a relationship with Lorne Michaels, and you can do that, or you can you know, get people to the point where they're booking television series or like an hour specials. I think I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's only one hour special that I haven't gotten on network television yet out of, you know, 35 or 40 of them. And, you know, that's, chances are that's the world telling you, okay, I think you can do this. And so artists, so artists will see that and they'll like, oh, fuck, this guy will help you. I just want to share one quick story that I remember. God, I just remembered it. 
I was working with Dane Cook, and Dane was living in a, a tiny little apartment in L.A. I think it was $800 a month. And he was so talented. He had so much vision. Still does. Credible, credible artist. Um, one of the most, uh, you know, credible guy who started social media for artists. Not just comics, musicians, you know, magicians, anybody. Um, had a real vision. And things started going well for him when we started working together. And he moved into the La Fontaine, which is a famous, famous apartment complex at Fountain and Crescent Heights between the Laugh Factory in Los Angeles and the Improv. Steve Martin lived there, Bette Midler, tons of people, uh, great people. I believe he moved into Steve Martin's old apartment, which had like 30-foot ceilings. It was just amazing. And um, I remember I was there one time, and I had left because he said uh, somebody was coming over. And he called me up about two hours later, and he said, uh, Patrice O'Neill came over my house. I said, oh, okay, I wish I had seen him. Uh, he said, yeah. He walked in, and this is all he did when he walked in. He just walked in, didn't even say hello to me, he just looked around, up and around at the ceilings and the expanse of the place. And the first thing he said, and he looked at me, he said, fucking berry cats. God damn fucking Barry Cats. And he wasn't saying it like, you know, fuck Barry Cats. He was saying it like, which I, I, I thought was a compliment, was that, you know, I was able to mix with every kind of talent and be like an accelerator to their fire. And, and... I don't, like I said, I don't claim to be the reason why, but I claim to be somebody who had a feeling, a sixth sense of how to, how to always figure out what artists wanted, look at what their bucket list was, and get them where they need to go. Where do you, because it, it sounds like you've got a very varied client list and have done over the years, and obviously running your own clubs means that you'll get a lot of applications in from comedians but it sounds like at the time of doing a lot of these clubs that we're talking about now it would have been more than ringing you up or, or coming to meet you in person and asking for spots rather than now when they might email a video or whatever so how are you scouting for talent like where, where other than your own clubs would you discover people well I mean back then there wasn't you know YouTube there wasn't really even email or anything all there was was video cassettes that you'd sort of go to the clubs. So I used to hang out in the clubs all the time. I In New York City, I'd go around to all the comedy clubs. There were a lot of them. I used to go to Harlem to the Uptown Comedy Club. That's where I found Tracy Morgan and a bunch of other artists. Um, and in L.A., I used to go to the Laugh Factory and the Improv and the Comedy Store. And I'd see a lot of different people. But to be honest with you, I... I never thought of myself as an aggressive person when it came to signing artists. I always signed a lot of young artists who, not that they didn't think about them, not that they didn't think they were funny, but most people at the time, they want to make money. They want to figure out to make money. You, you know, if you're signing Louis C.K., you know, when he's 18 years old, well, how much money is he going to make that year? Is he going to make, you know, if he makes $50,000, he's thrilled but what's five thousand dollars going to do for a, a management company really and so back then no one cared about that those kind of numbers and i didn't give a shit because i had money from the clubs i mean i wasn't a millionaire i wasn't even a thousandaire but i was comfortable you know i had i was i wasn't living check to check at the time and so you know, you could represent those kind of people and not worry about it. So, I mean, collectively, the group of people that I represented at the time, probably the first five years, you know, if collectively they made, 
you know, collectively they made a million dollars in five years, maybe that was a a miracle, maybe two million in five years. And so I wasn't really making that much money. I was sort of breaking even even with the management. But um, you know, to me it was only a matter of time before great things would happen. You somebody books a sitcom and you know, or a sitcom pilot and then you know, all of a sudden, even the shittiest salary for a sitcom for an artist is like maybe 25000 an episode. And then somebody starts booking movies, you know they're going to make a minimum of maybe a hundred or 250000 you know, if they got a substantial role. And then, you know, it just, you get Saturday Night Live, even if they, even if the deals were $5,000 an episode or or whatever it was, you know, you have four people on and so it, and I had big expenses. I had a huge office in New York City. I had an office in Boston. And then I started going to L.A. and had an office there. So I I put everything I had back in the business. And uh, and I just believed in these artists. And uh, luckily, it all worked out. And, um, and I'm honored that they gave me the opportunity to work with them. And even those that I don't work with anymore, I love them. I love them unconditionally, and I, I have a great relationship with almost all of them. I mean, Chappelle invited me and my son to Radio City Music Hall, got us tickets backstage, spent so much time with us. You know, those are things that you... Mike Epps I saw the other day, fantastic. Bill Burr, when I saw him, even though in the podcast he tears me a new colon, and it's probably one of the funniest podcasts you'll ever hear on Industry Standard. Every five minutes or ten minutes, he said, Barry, you know you know, I love you. And, and I truly believe that he does feel, you know, those kind of feelings, because I feel them for him, and um, these people are amazing. You know, Whitney Cummings, the hardest working person, I, and this is a person that, I'll tell anybody, this is the person who you visualize taking a shower with her iPhone in a Ziploc bag. You know, Frank Caliendo, this guy was a machine, just, you know, got up every morning at five in the morning and four in the morning calling radio stations that didn't know him to do his impressions. Just, I mean, so many different things I can think about, about these people, Jim Gaffigan, what a drive he had, you know, after he did Letterman and just a great actor and always, always uh, really fighting to be the best he could be. I mean, the list goes on and on, and I'm, I'm proud that I had the opportunity and humbled that I had the opportunity to work with them all. Do you think now, like with the age of the internet and the way that people can build their own fan bases and, you know, through like podcasting or Twitter or whatever it would be, do you think that if you if you were starting now, fewer people, more people would want to try and build their own fan base without giving some money to a management? Or do you think the role of a manager is still just as important? Well, the role of the manager is not as important to certain artists, you know, and the role of an agent is not important to certain artists, you know, so you're, you know, you look at certain people, YouTube stars or people who have built their own, look at, you know, people like Jake Paul and, um, you know, all these young people have millions of followers. The guy did a boxing pay-per-view. It probably did better than regular boxing. Um, so these so these people don't need anybody. They, they hire agents, and they might hire managers, but they hire them to facilitate things other than that what they've already accomplished. So they're not going to give... They're not going to give easily their revenue from what they're doing now to an agency or management company. They're going to say, hey, you want to represent me? Then whatever you get me in the future, I'll do it. So you look at somebody like Bo Burnham. You know, this is, this is a guy that was doing fucking songs in his bedroom and millions and millions of views. But he got a manager and he got a comedy special before he ever did stand-up. And did really well and toured all over. I remember when I hired him to, and Dane Cook hired him to open up for him. Just a great kid. And um, and with a great lane. But in the end, look what's happening now. Ten years later, you think to yourself, 
like if if I were to tell anybody when they so saw Bo Burnham five years ago, listen, uh, I'd like to invest my money in Bo Burnham to direct, write, and star in a movie. I'm sorry, direct, write, and produce a movie called Eighth Grade. Um, I really think he's the guy for that. And the guy, the executive, would be like, um, the guy who does the songs in his bedroom. Yeah, yeah, I think he can do this. He can write the screenplay and he can do this. Uh, yeah, nice talking to you, pal. Yet, the guy is doing the film. I think he's directing or directed Chris Rock's special. You know, and but it's not just him. It's like Jordan Peele. Yeah, uh, Jordan, we had this great thing for Jordan. He's writing a horror movie and it's going to be great. You're going to love it. Jordan Jordan Peele, the guy does the sketches, the comedy sketches. Yeah, yeah, uh, Jordan Peele, the guy who does the comedy specials. We want him to do this horror movie. We want you to write a check for uh, for $20 million. Huh? But, you know, everybody has their lane, and it's it's truly amazing. And, and, and when they finish with that lane, they should know that they have other lanes. And then when that lane gets exhausted, there's another lane. Because comedy breeds so many different areas, performing, uh, film dramatic acting, film comedy acting, TV comedy acting, TV dramatic acting, uh, hosting, reality shows, game shows, writing books. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. A need for comedians in some ways to diversify and to do more than just performing comedy. Um, do you think that the internet has extended the life cycle of a, of a comedian's career? And what role do you tend to play? Like if you, if you were with a comedian and they wanted to write a book, for example, what do you do to facilitate that? So well, I'll tell you, there's two questions there. Um, so we start with whether you think the internet has extended the life cycle of a comedian's career. Oh, well, for some, yes, and for others, no. I mean, do you see Dave Chappelle on the Internet? Do you see him on Twitter? Do you see him on Facebook and Instagram? No. Do you see him sell out an arena in one second? Yes. Um, so, uh, but then you look at somebody like, um, I mean, insert name here, you know, who's highly involved in social media, and... They need it, and it works for them. Everybody's different. Everybody, every artist is different. So that's, you know, it, it, of course it helps. You know, that's, that's like saying something like uh, in the legal profession, if um, electronic uh, digital documents helps. Well, yeah, it does help, but you still see the guy going home with that big fucking briefcase with the thousands of papers in it. And uh, he's still doing stuff the old school way, too. But, you know, anything can happen, and, and it's amazing how it does. You know, all it takes is people believing in you and then telling 10 people, and they tell 10 people, which is 100, and 100 tell, you know, 1,000, and 1,000 tell 10,000, and 10,000 tell 100,000, and 100,000 tell a million you look at Garfunkel and Oates. I mean, these are two young women who, actors and actresses, and, I'm sorry, actresses and sketch performers, and they get together and they create some songs, and fucking first song, I think, is 10 million views. So there's going to be people who go on the internet and get one view, and those who get 10 million, and, you know, the world speaks. The world tells you what's going to happen or not. You know, when you do this podcast with me, you know, I don't know how many podcast interviews you've done. Let's just pretend you've done a hundred. Okay? So out of those hundred, there's going to be one that's number one, the most popular one that you get the most feedback on and that people listen to and pass on over and over again. And there's going to be number 100. And just because you're speaking right now to number 100... Doesn't mean I don't have a chance to move up to maybe 97. I, I think you're doing better than you imagine. <laughs> okay, so 
Well, a, a, a base question that would be interesting, and I know it will compare, like it will, it will depend on the talent and who you're dealing with. But as a general rule, do you prefer to approach the talent, or do you prefer them to approach you now? That's a good question. Um, I mean, the logical thing to say would be that you have to be aggressive and you have to approach people and you have to let them know that you're ready and you're, you want to work with them. Traditionally, I've never been highly aggressive in terms of signing people. It's just organically happened and it's worked out well the way I do it, but I don't recommend it to other people. I think you have to be aggressive. I think you have to go for it. I, have to, I think you have to be persistent and without being creepy. And just let people know that you're, you can do the job and when the time comes, just to give you the meeting. Don't not take meetings. You can take meetings with anybody you want. Just give me a fucking meeting. Give me the chance to swing the bat. That's all, that's all you want, you know. And, and so other people will be like, hey, listen, don't meet with anybody else. Just sign with me right now. Everybody has their own philosophy. That, so, and, and a lot of those different philosophies work. There's a lot of great managers out there, um, and they all have different ways of doing things. Remember, you know, those listening, there's law school, there's medical school, there's business school, there's nursing school, there's no management college. It's you just learn by doing and trial and error. No one taught me shit. I had to learn it all myself, just trial and error, and... Um, and that's what I love about the podcast that I'm doing, this industry standard, which has been so incredible, is that I get to be helpful for other people out there and give them mentors through these interviews of people that are sharing their advice on how to get to the next level in any form of business. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask why you started a podcast, but it seems it seems to fit in with your, your motif of... Uh, enjoying passing on information, but also being as transparent as you can be. Would that be fair? Yeah, I mean, the reason why I started the podcast was, honestly, when you're a manager, it's this weird thing that, you know, you could get somebody, let's say, with their talent and your talent, a movie or a television series or Saturday Night Live, and you go home and you're so excited for them, and but then you realize that, You've only helped one person, and yeah, millions of people will watch them and be inspired, and maybe if you get them Saturday Night Live with their talent and yours, Lorne Michaels is happy, and NBC's happy, and but I think when I started the podcast, my goal was that I wanted to be in a situation where I could do something in my spare time that could make an impact on millions of people and where it could really be helpful and still do the management and be able to do what I do there and help one person at a time but also do the podcast where it helps millions and you know through interviews from everybody from Kevin Hart to Judd Apatow to Dr. Phil to David Copperfield, Caitlyn Jenner Chuck Lorre, um, it's just, uh, the list is endless, you know, it's just, um, I've been honored that they sat down with me and gave me the opportunity to help them tell their story, and, um, and it's, the feedback and the response is just almost, it's just paralyzing, it's so crazy, you just never think that you would think, because I'm a manager, you'd think I'd be saying to myself, yeah, this is going to happen, it's going to be successful, shit's going to go well, we're going to take it by storm. But I don't have that kind of personality for myself. I don't promote the podcast, barely promote it, I don't, I don't do anything. It's like, if it's not word of mouth, then fuck it. I'm not, I'm not going to kill myself, and I'm not in the business of promoting myself. I'm in the business of helping my clients and my television and film projects. I never trained to be a podcast host, and I'm just really humbled that it re it took off as as much as it had. And it's and the great part about it is for your audience, which just blows me away about it, is that you know they can just go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify or anything and just press a subscribe button, and it's free. They get the 
they get to listen to everything for free, all the advice of these amazing people and their stories of how they started with nothing and how they got to the next level. I, I want to share one s snippet of something that, that really affected me. I don't know why I'm telling you this one, but there's a comedian named Rita Rudner who is like an American treasure. She's been around for a long time. She had the longest running show in Vegas for a comedian. She agreed to do the podcast. She rarely, if ever, does podcasts. And, but she said I had to come to her and so I'm going to her address, and it's like there's like four gates to the property. I finally get to her place. It's this fucking palatial mansion on a cliff overlooking the ocean in Laguna, which is one of the most beautiful and wealthy areas of, of the coast. It's about probably an hour south of Los Angeles. And I'm interviewing her. And she tells me this story, which I thought was fascinating. She gave me a CD from her daughter, her daughter's music. And she said, you know, I knew my daughter wanted to do music and sing. And I remember going into a room and said, honey, I can give you a guitar. I can give you your own studio. I can build it here in the house. I can hire all the studio musicians you need. I can set up showcases for you for all the music agents and promoters in the country. I can get a great photographer to shoot the cover of your CD. I can get the best graphics people to do all the artwork. I can get singer-songwriters to help you write the song and produce it with you. I can give you anything you want. There's only one thing that I can't give you. And her daughter looks at her and says, what's that, Mom? And she said, adversity. These are the kind of things that blow you away because they're so simple. But you realize as you go along, the people that struggle, those are the people that have the holes blown through them. Those are the people that are driven to get to the next level. And the people that go through life with a net underneath them it's harder to motivate themselves to get where they want to go because they always know they have the net. They always know the rent might be paid or they'll be bailed out of whatever or the car breaks down, they don't have the money, there'll be somebody to take care of it. But the artists, the true artists who have the fight, sometimes it works out better. I'll tell you something else that's not even in a podcast. I was having lunch at the farm. The farm is a restaurant on Malibu Pier uh, in California. And this woman my age comes up to me, and she says, you're, you're Barry Katz, right? And I said, yeah, well, how do you know me? Or she says, well, I listened to the podcast. I said, oh, and I got up and I hugged her. And she said, my daughter's in the business. Uh, she's an actress. She's doing really, really well. And she told me her name. I said, oh, that's great. She said, uh, we grew up in the business. I said, ah, why is that? She said, I was married to Brian De Palma, famous director, producer. I said, oh, that must have been amazing. Your daughter must have got to work in some of the most amazing movies in the world. And she said, my daughter didn't work in one of my husband's movies. I said, why not? Because he said to her when she wanted to be an actress, I just want to let you know that you will never be in any of my movies. I'm never going to give you a break in any of my movies. And... She said, why is that, Dad? Because I want you to know what it's like to make it on your own. I want you to feel the pride of knowing that you did it yourself with your own mind and your own talent, and you didn't need somebody else to open the door and usher you into the game. I, good story. I, f I think it's true. I think it's, um, it's going to sound really odd, but I think... When you first start out taking the, like a career in the arts seriously, as in like you're not just going to open mics and trying stuff out, or you're not just giving it a try, if you like, I think the best thing that could happen to you is that you just get knocked back immediately. <laughs> and, and you have to kind of immediately face the reality of, oh, I've just been playing at the base of the mountain this whole time. Now is the climb. Um, I mean, over here there's a fair number of pretty new comedians who get picked up by the big uh, agents out here um, very early on. And there's a lot of, I wouldn't say resentment, but there's a lot of like negative 
words that go around when that happens or every time that happens. And I can't deny that I've felt a bit like, oh God, why are they, why is this person six months in or whatever getting picked up over me or someone else who's been going however long? But then you go, they're not, they're not going to get the push and they're not going to be as good in 10 years time as they would be if they had to wait five years for that. And so my, my question is probably, is there an, is, is there a point too early when you wouldn't work with someone or is there a point like what's the tipping point for you that you go, Oh, they're working hard enough. I would actually work with them as a manager. I'm a little different in that there is no tipping point. It's just, I shake their hand and it's like the dead zone in Chris with Christopher Walken long ago, that movie, you know, I can see the future. It's a very strange thing. I can't figure it out or else instinctually I'll just see a little clip or I'll see something or it's just the star quality, the undeniableness of of their personality and their talent. Um, you know, I can't stop them from complicating winning. I can't stop them from self-destructing most of the time. But with their talent, uh, you know, that's what drives me and that's what I look at, just the star quality that I see somebody who has the work ethic, somebody who I think can do anything. They can act, they can host, they can create. Look, when I met Whitney Cummings, she was a correspondent at the Sundance Film Festival. Um, she, she never written anything before. She never done stand-up comedy, never acted, never produced. But I met with her up there and I just thought that she had those abilities. And I just, wasn't shy about telling her that. Um, it doesn't mean that maybe she didn't have those feelings inside her as well, but maybe it was nice to hear it from somebody who'd done it before and to let her know that that she had it going on and she was a special person and a special artist and that she there was more to her than holding a microphone asking directors questions on the snowy streets of of Utah. How, so t- TV has been traditionally the way that an artist or, or a comedian in particular has been broken because it's such a, a lot of eyeballs being thrown on them in a very short space of time. The internet's disrupted that somewhat. Do you find that TV spots and, and I don't know whether you even have as many of them as we do, panel shows and things like that in America, um, do you find that that actually helps break a comedian in the same way as it used to? And how has that changed? Not even close. I mean, in the mid-80s, Roseanne Barr and Louis Anderson did sets on The Tonight Show and within six months of each other, and they were touring doing 5,000 seaters. They were developing their own sitcoms. Um, it's not even close. But what is... What happens is a set will go on, let's say, Conan or Colbert, and then they put it out online, and then it will go viral from there. Whereas before, you didn't have that. Nothing went online. You did The Tonight Show. That's the last time you saw that spot. It was appointment television. Now you see these spots, so you know. So I just like I just was at the comedy store, and I... Uh, I'm going to pronounce his name a few different ways because I don't know how to pronounce it. So I ran into, uh, at the comedy store last night, I ran into Sam Morrill. Sam Morrill. So, Sam Morrill. I don't know. What is how you pronounce <laughs> I don't know how you pronounce his name now. It's horrible. But I saw him do a set on Conan online. And I loved it. Great bit that he did about how, you know, it was kind of, it's, a really intelligent kind of slightly blue humor where he did a great routine about how his girlfriend gives him credit for the orgasm and you know he likes that but it's confusing to him and I'm paraphrasing because a lot of times he'll be in the middle of it and she'll say no just just stop just stay still just stay still right there oh that was the best I ever had and he's thinking to himself well I just I just stood there I didn't do anything but she's giving me credit he said that's like going to the barber and having him hold the clippers 
in one spot on your head and you move your head around and around and around and at the end of the haircut you say god that was the best haircut i ever had and so you know he just had great material i loved it and i went up to him and told him it was really special and uh he told me that he was um amy schumer was producing his first hour special for comedy central and i was really excited for him and um you know, you can just can tell when people are doing the right kind of stuff, and you can tell when people are doing the stuff that's not right. It doesn't take a genius, whether it's a person who works at McDonald's or a person who works at the Rocket Science Laboratory, to go to a comedy club and and see Jim Jeffries do a routine that's ten minutes long about Oscar Petoric killing his girlfriend and dragging himself across the stage like he has no legs and acting out the whole thing versus the guy who says, hey, you know, what part of the chicken does the McNuggets come from, huh? Ever see Gilligan's Island? Wasn't that a fantastic show? You know how they could make a blender out of two bamboo poles, but they couldn't fix a hole in a boat this big? It doesn't take a genius to figure out who's doing the right kind of comedy. You know... Am I going to watch a guy do a bit that's 12 minutes long on gun control? Or am I going to watch a guy fucking a stool for 10 minutes, imitating how he got action? You know, it's like we all know what's right and what's wrong in comedy. And comedians have an advantage now. They can study comics. You can study greatness, imitate greatness, and become great. And the problem is a lot of comedians still do that and they still go on stage with mediocrity. And it's, it's, it, it doesn't make sense to me. It's a very simple thing. Go on stage, be authentic, original, unique, powerful, and funny. Don't be derivative, ordinary, average, and good surely so i agree with all of that but to play devil's advocate which basically means being a wanker and trying to get away with it i if you if you find something funny as a as a writer or comedian and you want to perform it even if you think ah, this you know like dating it's been covered a million times or ah, family life has been covered a million times if you want to perform it and you can put your own spin on it surely there's no subject that's like too too worn down and too hack or you are you talking about something different have i misunderstood what you mean by being amazing look simon let's cut through all the shit okay how many comedians in the uk if you were to poll a hundred comedians anonymously and you said tell me on the names of all the comedians who are brilliant, who are geniuses, who are incredible, who, holy shit, I can't fucking believe what I just saw tonight funny. How many names would be on the list? I can think of four. Okay, so four would be on your list, okay? Out of all the, out of all the comedians in the UK, how many comedians are there in the UK right now? Seven, no, uh... Uh, a few, 10,000, maybe? 10,000. So there's four, so there's four brilliant, extraordinary comedians who are geniuses out of 10,000. Out of 10,000 in the UK that are extraordinary, brilliant geniuses. Can you imagine, can you imagine like you have like a bad heart? You're like, the doctor says, oh, we diagnosed you. You got to get an open heart surgery. You're like, oh, yes, you're going to be saved. You're so excited. And then he says, well, don't get so excited because there's only four guys who are brilliant enough to do the surgery for you. The others are, they're, they're good. You know, we can, hey, we can get you the operation with somebody who's, who's good, very good. Well, no, I want one of the fucking four that's great, that's extraordinary, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's that's a that's a seven year waiting list for that guy. Or you're going to jail, you're about to go to jail and you need a great lawyer to, to take you 
where you need to go to get you off. And they say, listen, the good news is we think this case is winnable. We can get you off. Yes, my case is winnable. Uh, the bad news is there's only four attorneys that are extraordinary enough to get you off. And, uh, but you can go with a very good one, and there might be a chance you'll do well. So what I'm saying is, is that if all comedians studied those four comedians, how they do it, what kind of stuff they're doing, how they're approaching their comedy, and I'm not saying to take their comedy or take their persona, but look at the formula. Study the fucking blueprints of who's doing it, who's making it happen. And then figure out a way to do it. Yes, I watched the Cat Williams special recently. Yes, it's his fourth special. Yes, he talks about Jacksonville for 20 minutes. Yes, he talks about his dick for another 15 minutes. But he's fucking funny. He's working his ass off. And if I, if I saw a new comedian doing that, I'd take him aside and say, Listen, you're never going to make it doing that. But Cat Williams paid his fucking dues. He's done specials that are unbelievable, like just beyond unbelievable. So, so this special, he maybe he did this one for him. Maybe he did this one. You know, Chris Rock has done amazing specials. One of his specials, he did 10 minutes of Michael Jackson material. The best Michael Jackson material you'll ever hear in your entire life by a hundred times, but Michael Jackson material. He paid his fucking dues. He knows he's the best at doing it. He's having fun. He's great. It's hilarious. If I see young comics starting off doing 10 minutes of Michael Jackson material, chances are I'm going to tell him, don't do the Michael Jackson material. But I, am I going to tell Chris Rock not to do the Michael Jackson material? No, I loved it. Because I've already heard seven fucking hours of the most brilliant stuff that's ever been created and he's, he's earned that right. And so that's the thing about comedians. You know, don't go up on stage immediately doing dick jokes and fucking and drugs and menstruation and spit and sperm and, and you know, I was just shit-faced. And, you know, it's like, you know, go on and don't do gay jokes. You don't do, like, lowest con common denominator jokes. And if you are going to do them then make them smart. You know, one of Whitney Cummings' first jokes that was so edgy, she said, the people come up to me all the time, they say, Mary, guys always say marriage is like prison. Marriage is like prison. I say no, because in prison, you get to have anal sex. So, again, a blue joke, but smart. You know, uh, Allie Breen from New York, great joke right up front, uh... Um, I don't drink, which makes it kind of hard when you're dating. I'll sit down with a guy on a first date, and the first thing I'll tell him, I'll say, listen, I don't drink, but I just want you to know I'm still capable of making bad decisions. And so, you know, that's a clean joke talking about alcohol. You know, so you can do things that are unique and special that don't have to have the lowest con common denominator thing. You can do clean ones. You can do dirty ones. You can do, uh, you know, Kirk Fox, I just saw the other night. He did, like, an opening set, and it was, like, uh, you know, uh, he did, like, 45 seconds of, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, this is what my sign is. I'm a nice guy. I enjoy long walks on the beach, preferably that end in a blowjob, uh, preferably that don't end with me getting, uh, preferably that don't end with me giving one. And, you know, we just, like, but it's, like, the way he got into it was just so unique and smart. And knowing that I butchered probably all three of those jokes, but you get the point, is that it's like there's ways of, of doing things and getting into things that work and, and that, that are special. And you can, still, you can still do a routine on an airline, but something original about the airline. Maybe it's the, you know, maybe you're talking about the wing, Maybe you're talking about the flap on the wing. You know, I'm sitting and I see the flap and I'm wondering, like, how does the flap work? Is it going to go down? Is it going to go up? What's happening? Just look at Gary Gullman. Anybody in your audience, listen to Gary Gullman. Any set on Gary Gullman. This guy, 
I saw a set of his, an old set where he's he's talking. I mean, it's it, it was incredible. He was talking about uh, this is a five year old set. He was talking about how Greece went bankrupt. He's like, I don't feel sorry for Greece. I mean, they're a country. They went bankrupt. I don't feel sorry for them. How can you feel sorry about a country that hasn't done anything or created anything since the Olympics? I mean, two thousand years they haven't done anything. I mean, you know, they for a while there they had a good run with the salad. You know, it was a good salad. It was filling, light, but filling. But, you know, are you going to get anywhere with a salad? Is that your contribution to society for 2,000 years, a salad? I mean, maybe they'll hit with this new yogurt thing. Maybe that'll take place and it'll work. And he did like a 10-minute routine on the Greeks. It's just, who does that? Like, I saw another set of his where he did like, it seemed like he did a half hour on fruit. Grapes versus grapefruits. And and again, this might not mean anything to anybody and might have no social relevance. But everybody has their own style of humor in their lane, what makes them happy and what drives them and gets them to the next level. And there's going to be people who are going to love Gary Goldman and don't like Allie Breen and love Kirk Fox and not like Chris Rock but like Chappelle or vice versa and everything in between. And that's what's great about comedy. It's like... It's like music. There's going to be somebody listening to Barry Manilow's greatest hits right now on the way home. And there's going to be another person, you know, listening to, you know, uh, Tupac. And there's going to be another person listening to Eminem, another person listening to Don Henley. And they hate all the other ones. But, you know, Will Rogers used to say long ago, you know, if 1% of the people love you, you're going to get where you want to go. You'll be a big star. Now, if you really think about it, if 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% and keep me saying that over and over again on a loop of the people love you, you're going to be a star and you're going to be huge. So you don't have to reach everybody. You don't have to. You only have to reach a tiny little bit of people and you'll be a fucking millionaire. That's all you have to do. And so it's not as daunting as you think if you're an artist. And you can do it. You can make it. As an actor and actress, you can fail 99 out of 100 times and you book one job and it can be on the air for seven years. It's a great time to be an artist. It's a great time to be a comedian. It's a great time to be a writer. And and all of the artists listening, you have the power. And those of you in other businesses you too have the power because all you have to do is navigate and figure out what you need to do to outwork, outsmart, and navigate, out-navigate your competition. And even then, even if you don't out-navigate them and three people pass you, there's still room for you to make an impact and keep driving, keep growing, and keep getting to the next level until you get to your destination. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for coming on. Awesome. This was amazing talking to you. Thank you so much, Simon, and uh, thank you so much for having me on. It's a real honor to be on this podcast and to be asked. And and then can I plug my podcast? Yep, go for it. Is that legal? It's fine. I was going to plug it anyway, but you can do it if you want. Uh, Save me the, the effort of it. Oh, okay. Well, if you want to do it to you, you can just do what I do. So, and and just I just want to let everybody know, please check out Industry Standard Podcast on all platforms. Uh, I can guarantee you it will change your life forever if you can get past the sound of my voice. So just subscribe, have fun, and enjoy it, and uh, let me know how you like it at, at Barry Katz on, a, on Twitter. On a personal note, because what I was going to say about it is I've listened to about half a dozen, maybe a dozen episodes now, and I really enjoy it. Uh, and it's it's a it's very it, we have a lot of crossover between the two of us except i feel like you focus a lot more on on star celebrity people and i focus on people who are behind the scenes and intermittently bring stars on so if you like my podcast you'll definitely like barry's so i i'm i'm i know just from being with you and talking with you that um I'm sure you're being humble when your podcast blows mine the fuck away. I'm probably a speck on the ground compared to yours. So uh, I'm just uh, honored that you had me. Thank you very much. Thank you, boss.
That was Barry, hearing his thoughts on the future of the industry, but also how you don't need to be known by so many people now, was really interesting. Like the small percentage of people that you just need to know who you are to be quote unquote famous really is inspiring for someone like me. It's it's resonated a lot with the comedians that I've had on before who don't really consider themselves to be famous except in their tribe and also really reflected some of the work I've done in the past in for example my book How to Make a Living by Working for Free where I interviewed a lot of comedians who were like well I have 20,000 fans and that's it and you think 20, well, I mean, 20,000 is a lot of people, but you think of a big name comedian, you think millions of fans all the way around the world, the, the Russell Brands of the world, or whoever you want to name. Whereas there are a lot of comedians who go, No, I got my, I got my people, I'm fine. Also, if you, if you want to buy a copy of my book in which I interview people like Richard Herring about how they built their fan base and how they asked their fan base to support them after they've created free content that they value, uh, there'll be a link in the description. It's £5 digitally on Amazon, or it's, I think, £13, £11, £13, something like that, for a paperback copy, and you'll be buying that direct from me on my website. So please do do that. It'd be a lovely birthday gift uh, for me if you missed getting me something back in December. Honestly, as someone who, who, who is very DIY and hates how much I don't feel like that ethos exists in the UK, when at least I compare it to the US, I loved hearing that from him, and I found the whole thing really fascinating and inspiring. So I can't thank him enough for coming on. If you'd like to check out his podcast, as well, uh, Industry Standard. There'll be a link for that in the show notes. If you like this one, you'll definitely like that one because basically it's the same thing but with comedians from the US and agents from the US and that sort of thing. So it's been quite a nice collaboration between the two of us. Also, if you've liked this episode and you want to hear more from agents on my podcast, I'd highly recommend the episode with Charlotte Austin of Catface Talent. Well, it, it used to be known as Catface Talent. It has recently relaunched under Austin Talent. Um, I've left the podcast under the same name, so just scroll back and find Charlotte's name in there uh, because I felt like, for historical reasons, it should have have her name on there but I've also added in tags so that people can search for it properly just have a look okay you'll find it Charlotte Austin catface talent she does an amazing job Jeff Whiting I interviewed for Murf Control uh, one of the biggest management and booking agencies uh, in the country so if you really want to learn more about what it takes to get an agent and what agents are looking for in this country those two would be the, a great place to start your research the Ask the Industry podcast is a fruit that got in gravity's way production for the internet all elements were created by me comedian Simon Kane. thank you very much for listening thank you very much for subscribing and thank you very much for rating and donating if you do I'll see you all in about 14 days time uh, before you go, before you go, before you go, uh, I just want to quickly say uh, I'm going to be at the Edinburgh Festival. I'm drilling down the details on dates, times, and all that sort of stuff. But just so you're aware, uh, I'm going to be at the Edinburgh Festival in 2019. I'm also going to be previewing the show from about April onwards around the country. And then I'm going to be on tour in September and October. Now, this is the most vague plug I've done for anything, but essentially I'm going to be updating my website with these details as soon as they are available. Please do keep an eye out for them. I'd really appreciate it as that would really help. The one thing I can confirm is I am doing a one-off potentially DVD record. Again, that is something I'm, I'm dealing with. I'm sorting it out of sex drugs and other things I never do at the Bloomsbury Theatre in London on the 21st of March 2019. If you can come to that, please do. Uh, if you would like to get half off the tickets, tweet me. Tweet, tweet me something like... Tweet, tweet, me, tweet me something mysterious like, my, uh, my favourite macaroon is strawberry flavoured, right? Tweet, tweet me that and I would DM you the discount code so you can get money off your tickets to come and see that show live i'd really love to get some of your listeners in and to watch the show i'm really really excited about it but also really nervous about it as it's quite a big space even though it's uh, the studio space but um yeah i want to get the the thing recorded and out the door so if you can come please do if you can't come please tell a friend and hopefully they'll come thanks for listening bye